Let us rejoice that we behold this day. Let us be thankful that we have lived to see the bright and happy breaking of the auspicious morn which commences the third century of the history of New England. Auspicious indeed, bringing a happiness beyond the common allotment of providence to men, full of present joy, and gilding with bright beams the prospect of futurity, is the dawn that awakens us to the commemoration of the landing of the pilgrims. Living at an epoch which naturally marks the progress of the history of our native land, we have come hither to celebrate the great event with which that history commenced. Forever honored be this, the place of our father's refuge, forever remembered the day which saw them, weary and distressed, broken in everything but spirit, poor in all but faith and courage, at last secure from the dangers of wintry seas, and impressing this shore with the first footsteps of civilized man. It is a noble faculty of our nature which enables us to connect our thoughts, our sympathies, and our happiness with what is distant in place or time, and looking before and after to hold communion at once with our ancestors and our posterity. Human and mortal although we are, we are nevertheless not mere insulated beings without relation to the past or the future. Neither the point of time nor the spot of earth in which we physically live bounds our rational and intellectual enjoyments. We live in the past by a knowledge of its history, and in the future by hope and anticipation, by ascending to an association with our ancestors, by contemplating their example and studying their character, by partaking their sentiments and imbibing their spirit, by accompanying them in their toils, by sympathizing in their sufferings and rejoicing in their successes and their triumphs. We mingle our own existence with theirs and seem to belong to their age. We become their contemporaries, live the lives which they lived, endure what they endured, and partake in the rewards which they enjoyed. And in like manner, by running along the line of future time, by contemplating the probable fortunes of those who are coming after us, by attempting something which may promote their happiness, and leave some not dishonorable memorial of ourselves for their regard, when we shall sleep with the fathers, we protract our own earthly being, and seem to crowd whatever is future as well as all that is past, into the narrow compass of our earthly existence. As it is not a vain and false, but an exalted and religious imagination which leads us to raise our thoughts from the orb which, amidst this universe of worlds, the Creator has given us to inhabit and to send them with something of the feeling which nature prompts and teaches to be proper among children of the same eternal parent to the contemplation of the myriads of fellow beings with which his goodness has peopled the infinite of space. So neither is it false or vain to consider ourselves as interested and connected with our whole race through all time, allied to our ancestors, allied to our posterity, closely compacted on all sides with others, ourselves being but links in the great chain of being which begins with the origin of our race, runs onward through its successive generations, binding together the past, the present, and the future, and terminating at last with the consummation of all things earthly at the throne of God. There may be, and there often is indeed, a regard for ancestry which nourishes only a weak pride, as there is also a care for posterity which only disguises an habitual avarice or hides the workings of a low and groveling vanity, but there is also a moral and philosophical respect for our ancestors which elevates the character and improves the heart. Next to the sense of religious duty and moral feeling, I hardly know what should bear with stronger obligation on a liberal and enlightened mind than a consciousness of alliance with excellence, which is departed, and a consciousness, too, that in its acts and conduct, and even in its sentiments and thoughts, it may be actively operating on the happiness of those who come after it. Poetry is found to have few stronger conceptions by which it would affect or overwhelm the mind than those in which it presents the moving and speaking image of the departed dead to the senses of the living. This belongs to poetry, 
only because it is congenial to our nature. Poetry is, in this respect, but the handmaid of true philosophy and morality. It deals with us as human beings, naturally reverencing those whose visible connection with this state of existence is severed, and who may yet exercise we know not what sympathy with ourselves, and when it carries us forward also, and shows us the long-continued result of all the good we do in the prosperity of those who follow us, till it bears us from ourselves and absorbs us in an intense interest for what shall happen to the generations after us. It speaks only in the language of our nature and affects us with sentiments which belong to us as human beings. Standing in this relation to our ancestors and our posterity, we are assembled on this memorable spot to perform the duties which that relation and the present occasion imposed upon us. We have come to this rock to record here our homage for our pilgrim fathers, our sympathy in their sufferings, our gratitude for their labors, our admiration of their virtues, our veneration for their piety, and our attachment to those principles of civil and religious liberty, which they encountered the dangers of the ocean, the storms of heaven, the violence of savages, disease, exile, and famine, to enjoy and to establish. And we would leave here also for the generations which are rising up rapidly to fill our places some proof that we have endeavored to transmit the great inheritance unimpaired that in our estimate of public principles and private virtue, in our veneration of religion and piety, in our devotion to civil and religious liberty, in our regard to whatever advances human knowledge or improves human happiness, we are not altogether unworthy of our origin. There is a local feeling connected with this occasion too strong to be resisted, a sort of genius of the place which inspires and awes us. We feel that we are on the spot where the first scene of our history was laid, where the hearths and altars of New England were first placed, where Christianity and civilization and letters made their first lodgment in a vast extent of country covered with a wilderness and peopled by roving barbarians. We are here at the season of the year at which the event took place. The imagination irresistibly and rapidly draws around us the principal features and the leading characters in the original scene. We cast our eyes abroad on the ocean, and we see where the little bark with the interesting group upon its deck made its slow progress to the shore. We look around us and behold the hills and promontories where the anxious eyes of our fathers first saw the places of habitation and of rest. We feel the cold which benumbed and listen to the winds which pierced them. Beneath us is the rock on which New England received the feet of the pilgrims. We seem even to behold them as they struggle with the elements and, with toilsome efforts, gain the shore. We listen to the chiefs in council. We see the unexampled exhibition of female fortitude and resignation. We hear the whisperings of youthful impatience, and we see what a painter of our own has also represented by his pencil, chilled and shivering childhood, houseless, but for a mother's arms, couchless, but for a mother's breast, till our own blood almost freezes. The mild dignity of Carver and of Bradford, the decisive and soldier-like air and manner of Standish, the devout Brewster, the enterprising Allerton, the general firmness and thoughtfulness of the whole band, their conscious joy for dangers escaped, their deep solicitude about dangers to come, their trust in heaven, their high religious faith, full of confidence and anticipation, all these seem to belong to this place, and to be present upon this occasion to fill us with reverence and admiration. 